Well, it still is Epiphany season, or should I say the season after Epiphany, and we are still focusing on signs and wonders. And so today we move to the beginning of the gospel in the first chapter of Mark. And I got to tell you, as I as I read this, it affected me. It, it touched me. And a couple of things came immediately to mind. And the first thing I realized is that I am not called to be the pastor of this church. Uh, some churches, their pastors express their relationship with the church as a call, but in our United Methodist denomination, it's clear to me that I am not called to be the pastor of Christ by the sea. In fact, I was never called to be your pastor. Instead, we say, I was sent to be the pastor here. And there's a huge difference. Because when you're sent to do something, you're sent to do a task, take on a responsibility, fulfill a role, and these are all important things, and all of us have been in a business, some place of employment, uh, working with our children at home, where we have been sent, right? I can remember being sent to the grocery store to get diapers and formula because we needed them. But it's a task. It's something you do. A call is of an entirely different nature. The call is about who you are, your very being. And today that's what we want to talk about because this is the call of the gospel. So let's begin. This is after the baptism of Jesus. And in verse 14, it reads like this. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of God. Well, the first thing I want to say about this calling experience of Jesus is that you could simply look at it as a recruitment drive. You know, he gets his basic message out there and then begins to recruit followers. It's a natural move. It's, it's something that any startup company does. You know, they get their business idea, their plan, and then they begin to attract to them uh, the best people they can to carry off this new company. And you could look at it this way, but I think there's a deeper meaning here for us, particularly as Christians. And it's this, that this story begins with a tragedy. A huge tragedy, a huge setback for God's people. And it's mentioned just briefly in the 14th verse. Now, after John was arrested, John the Baptist was huge. His, uh, his fame went throughout the region. People flocked to him in the wilderness to receive baptism, to repent of their sins and turn in a new direction. He was a giant figure. He was, in many ways, the heart and soul of what God was doing amongst his people. You know, on one side you had the Romans with their oppression, and on the other side you had, 
Herod and the temple that was so corrupt. And in the middle of it all, John stood and proclaimed repentance and forgiveness and the opportunity for a new life. And it was, it was a source of life and freedom. And then Mark says, he was arrested. He was arrested. They, they came. And they got him. They cuffed him. They made him do the perp walk, right? They threw him in a dank prison. And one day, he would lose his life in that prison. He never came out. And so, for God's people that must have seemed to be a very dark day. And for the Herodians and, and the Romans, it was probably a day of rejoicing. They, they probably said to themselves, well, that was easy. Problem solved. Bach checks. Get rid of the Baptist. Too often, I think, we think that simple historical disasters, setbacks, troubles can thwart the will of God. But now, as we reread the story of John's arrest in the context of Jesus' ministry, what we see is that God is taking John off the stage so that Jesus can stand in the center of it. The torch has been passed from one to the other. And now Jesus is the one who is the focus of God's redemptive love. And how he does it is significant. You see, John withdrew to the wilderness and called for people to come out to him. We'll see in this passage that Jesus instead goes to the people and calls them specifically. So then, he walks along the seashore and he calls a handful of fishermen. These are not the only ones he called, but they're the first ones. We also remember that he called Levi, the tax gatherer, just walked past his booth where he was... Um, squeezing people of their taxes, and he said simply, follow me. Levi got up and followed him. And what's so interesting in Mark's gospel is that there is no explanation as to why they did this. People read Mark and they think, well, they must have heard about Jesus, and so uh, they liked his message or his fame preceded him. Perhaps they knew that Jesus had been baptized by John, and so therefore he seemed legitimate. But in fact, this is in Galilee, so it is some distance from the ministry of John down in Judea. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German theologian during the Second World War, who paid for his life for his devotion to Jesus, comments on these verses and says that in fact, what Mark is telling us Primarily, it's what he's not telling us. He doesn't give motivation, reason. He doesn't say whether they're following Jesus out of fear or love, whether they are drawn to him or whether they are scared of him. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't say whether they, are going, they think that they are going to sit on his left and his right in the kingdom of God or whether they're simply going on an adventure. In fact, what Mark is saying is that why we say yes to the call is less important than the fact that the call comes to us. And regardless of our motivation, whether it's selfish or generous, something happens to us when we respond to that call. So the most famous 
perhaps some of the most famous lines in the Bible is what Jesus offers these two, these first two fishermen, James and John, or excuse me, Simon and Andrew. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I like the old version, or fish for people. That's such an interesting phrase. You think of these guys as they are casting out their nets. Suddenly, they're being challenged to go after something entirely different. And the image of fishing stands out large here, I think, because I think every one of us, at some point or another, has grabbed a fishing pole and sat by a pond or by the sea and tried their hand at fishing. But I am reminded that the image that we have of fishing today, you know, people standing as they do at Vero Beach on the edge of the ocean, casting their lines out into the water, is not the image that the Bible actually presents us. Because they didn't catch fish with hooks, lines, or sinkers. Instead, the act of fishing involved a host of men standing at nets, pulling them in, catching not just one fish, but many fish, hopefully, if the catch was good that day. So Jesus is not just calling individuals, but he's, in call, he's calling um, business partners. These are commercial fishermen. He's calling people who can work together, who have some sense of that. Still, I think there's another hidden reality here, and it's simply this. Jesus looks at these guys and says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Well, why does he say that to them? Why does he use the image of fishers? Well, because they're fishermen. So it speaks to their heart, right? But what if they were instead farmers? I think he might have said, follow me and I will make you plant people for the kingdom of God. What if they were builders? I think he would have said, follow me and I will make you build up the body of Christ. Or something like that. Now what if they were corporate tax, la corporate tax lawyers on Wall Street? He would say, I don't know what he'd say, but he'd say something. He would say something to speak into their heart. And this is important to understand. When Jesus extends the call, it's not just a blanket call to all humanity. Rather, he speaks into your life, your context, your situation, and calls you. That's the real lesson here. But beyond that, there's another lesson, and it's simply this, that Jesus is going to make us, make us into something. When I was a kid in Fort Lauderdale growing up, um, somehow uh, the church I attended, believe it or not, we had, um, we actually had a couple of kids whose parents were involved in organized crime. It's true. Uh, their parents didn't come to church, but they came to youth group and we loved them. But um, I remember going to one of my friend's house for a pool party with our youth group, and it was on the intercoastal waterway, an enormous house, and all around the backyard were Italian statuary, and there were men in suits standing on the edge of the seawall looking out while we had our pool party. And somebody, somebody mentioned to me, I think he's a made man. And I said, what? And that was uh, Sam's father. He was not just in organized crime, but he was in La Cosa Nostra. That is to say, 
he was a made man. And if you were considered to be a made man, you were head and shoulders above everybody else in the organization. When you were made, suddenly you had powers and authority that had exceeded your grasp before that moment. Now, I know it's crazy to compare Jesus' calling of his disciples with the initiation of mobsters, but the phrase, a made man, lingers in my mind. And, and what it tells me is simply this, is that when you're called, you are made, remade, so to speak. You are transformed into somebody and something else. Your priorities are radically reordered. And Jesus becomes the center point of your life, your focus. To him, all your obedience is given. Now, we know that this didn't happen instantly. In fact, we know that these disciples, particularly Simon, as they make their way through the story of Mark, they blunder, they make mistakes, they get the answers wrong, they frustrate Jesus, they drive him absolutely crazy with their selfishness and their lack of understanding of the gospel. But nonetheless, nonetheless, they've made that commitment. And to tell you the truth, the story of Mark, or any gospel, is really a story of rebirth. People sign up. They step forward. They join. They hear the call. And they put their best foot forward. And then they fail. And they struggle. It's a hard process. To me, it is a rebirth that they go through. We talk about this all the time in Christianity. In the evangelical tradition, we talk about being born again or born from above or receiving the divine adoption. And this is the beginning part of it. These are, as it were, the labor pains of making that transformation. I wonder how many of our ladies here in this audience today have given birth. Was it an easy process? Was it simple? Was it just a day at the hospital and done? No. As a matter of fact, for many of us, for many of us it comes suddenly and almost unexpectedly, and we think it's going to happen, especially that first child, and then you wait and wait and wait and wait, sometimes hours, sometimes days for that first child to show up. It's excruciating, just the waiting. Jesus compares the coming of his kingdom to a woman in labor sometimes. And so what's this, what this means is that it's not easy and sometimes it's quite difficult. Sometimes there'll be ups and downs, sometimes betrayal and failure. But the call upon us is greater than anything with which we can resist it, our own stupidity, our own selfishness our own desire to be right all the time and to pummel anybody who disagrees with us, all that recedes and the deep wisdom of God finally overtakes us in resurrection. This Simon who responds to Jesus becomes Peter and then after the resurrection, becomes somebody entirely different than he ever was before. My friends, 
God's call is upon you. The call of the gospel. Jesus says, follow me. Have you responded? And more importantly, do you understand that in your everyday life, he is remaking you. He is changing you. You are being born again. It doesn't happen necessarily in an instant. It might take years, a lifetime perhaps, of being transformed. But he will not be deterred. And even though there are things, disasters, troubles that seem to overtake us, and sometimes even when we read in the headlines things so dark they, they blot out hope, the call is not detained at all. Even the very worst things that can happen to us can be transformed into servants of God's will. So have you heard the call of God? And have you decided to follow Jesus? Let's pray, shall we? Almighty God, we understand that you are remaking us. And for those of us who are Moving into our senior years, we wonder what could you possibly make of us now? Perhaps we are beyond the possibility of being reshaped. But we know that's not true. We read the Bible, and young and old alike, when put in your grasp, are transformed. Forgive us, O oh God, when we think that we have uh, exceeded our expiration date, when, when we think that we are no longer serviceable for service in God's kingdom. Instead, speak the call louder to us, clearer. Break into our minds. Break open our hearts. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.